Hello guys and welcome to TGN, the game nerd the shore. I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing Zero Escape, 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and we learned more about this weird substance called Ice-9. Uh, it's some sort of weird polymorph of H2O where for some reason it freezes at 96 degrees Fahrenheit. Super weird. But anyways, in this episode, we're going to be continuing on down the true ending route and seeing what we can find. Anyways, back to the large hospital room. We're going to talk to Santa again. Uh, who do you think did it? Someone other than the eight of them. Maybe there's someone else on the ship with us. You mean someone hiding here? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just an idea. And you're saying the, myst the mystery person fixed the reds? Yeah. Why? That's, um... I don't know. Santa shoved his hands into his pocket and cracked his knuckles. Seems unlikely. Why? I don't know, just a feeling. Hard to believe Zero would bring us to bring in a secret tenth player. I mean, the name of the game is the Nonary Game, for Christ's sake. You know what Nonary means, right? It means nine. No, that's not what I meant. I mean, more like someone who's been living here for a long time. Someone who, like, stayed here. Seriously? It's even more ridiculous. What do you think Zero would leave them alone? Junpei furrowed his brow. Hmm. Someone living here, huh? Or someone staying here, rather. An interesting thought. One interesting, uh, bit of media that exists, I'm going through door 7, by the way. There's a novelization of this game, which is, like, an alternate universe sort of thing. Uh, so it's not like an adaptation of this game. I mean, it's similar, but it still has a lot of differences where you should play the game first before you actually read the novel. Uh, but in that, I'm pretty sure uh, the route that Junpei goes on is 476, which ends with the knife ending, if you play through it that way in the game. Uh, speaking of 999 novels... Uh, there's the mobile port, which I talked about previously, but in that game, uh, it's less because the entire game is in first person from, like, Junpei's perspective. And in the novel, uh, not the novel, in the mobile port, uh, it's different where you also get to see Junpei's face. Like, they have a background and then they just have these sort of cards, uh, that flash on screen. They sort of have these cards with the characters' faces on them that just show up on screen. And so Junpei has a card, and he has a couple of different sprites. I'll see if I can show them on screen right now. Uh, just very interesting stuff to look at. I never... Uh, I don't know much about the mobile port. Uh, because I don't think it's on... It's in... Like, the... I don't think they're actually selling it anymore. Because, you know, they have uh, the uh, Nonary Games version that includes uh, Virtue's Last Reward. But yeah, there's some interesting stuff in that version. Uh, a few interesting key differences and stuff like that. Ooh, here's something new. Here's where Seven was talking about uh, the EDT crystals and how... It's a pretty similar story to the crystallization of glycerin, where they had these molecules, and they wanted to make hydrates, but they couldn't. And then one day they were able to make a hydrate, and suddenly they couldn't not make hydrates. And so Junpei jumps in, Seven says, It was like, man, how do you say it? And Junpei says, Like the, mo like the molecules were communicating with one another. Transmitting information in a way humans couldn't perceive. This phenomena spread throughout the world. Alright? Junpei looked up at Seven with a half with half a smirk. Seven stared at him, dumbfounded. Yeah, that's, uh... That's it exactly. But... How did you know? I heard another story kind of like that one. When? In the freezer. What? The freezer? This is how Junpei told Seven the story he'd heard from June in the freezer in the kitchen. How one day, glycerin began to crystallize, and the story of ice that wouldn't melt at room temperature. 
When Junpei was done, Seven looked thoughtful and absent-mindedly rubbed the scar on his chin. Ice that doesn't melt at room temperature, huh? That sound familiar? Yeah, hold up. I feel like I can remember something. It's right there. Seven squinted. His eyes stared off into space as if he were trying desperately to focus on something far away. Do you know about Ice Nine? Ice Nine. Ice Nine. Ice Nine. Ice, Ice. Ice, ice, ice. Suddenly, Seven's eyes shot open. That's it! I remember now! That woman! She's here on the boat! That woman? Alice! Who's Alice? Come on, the woman who won't melt at room temperature. It became clear to Seven that Junpei had no idea what he was talking about. He ran his hand across his face and took a deep breath. You know how the Titanic sank on April 15th, 19 1912, right? Yeah, more than 1,500 people died. Worst mar maritime accident in history. What about it? Did you hear the boat that was sent to collect the dead bodies? Uh, I think that was the RMS Carpathia, right? It was a cruise liner just like the Titanic. No, that was the ship that picked up the survivors. The ship that collected the dead bodies was the CS McKay Bennett. McKay Bennett showed up on April 17th, two days after the accident. Set out from Halifax, a port in Canada, and recovered 300, 306 bodies. The Atlantic that far north was really cold. It would have to be for there to be icebergs and stuff. Anyway, the bodies they pulled out of the water were frozen solid. This isn't a very nice story. So, what happened next? Well, they say the McCabe Bennett recovered something more than just dead bodies. There were various bits of stuff floating around the water. Things the drowned had carried with them, or stuff dislodged as the ship sank. One of the things they found was a coffin. A coffin? Yeah, a wooden one. The craftsman who'd made it must have been pretty skilled. It wasn't just a wooden coffin. It was all wood. There were no nails or reinforcements, and there were no gaps in the wood anywhere. It was airtight. The crew got pretty curious about what might be inside and opened it up. They had to get a wedge and hammer it open. It was so well made. Inside, they found a woman. Or I guess you should say they found the dead body of a woman. Her hair was thick and black, and her skin was deep brown and didn't show any signs of age or decomposition. They say that she looked gorgeous, like a goddess. She was obviously dead, but everyone who looked at her said that she just looked like she was sleeping. Her skin was so lifelike that she looked like she might wake up any minute. She didn't, though. Like the rest of the bodies they found, she was frozen solid. Eventually, the McKay Bennett finished the search and returned to Halifax. The 306 bodies were unloaded and taken ashore. However, it was warm enough that they began to melt. They say that the stink was horrible. But there was one body that didn't thaw. The girl in the coffin. That's right. Everybody thought for sure that she'd melt and start to rot like the rest of them eventually. But weeks passed and nothing happened. Then a month had passed, and another, and it was summer and she was still frozen solid. After a while, people started to say she was some sort of miracle. Rumors about the girl started to spread and people came to visit Halifax from all over. After a while, people started to call her All Ice, Alice. Of course, those rumors didn't last long. Why? Well, she up and disappeared. One day, Alice was there, and the next she wasn't. They say someone snuck into where they were keeping her and stole the body. With the body gone, the rumors followed pretty quickly. And after a while, no one remembered her. You might be able to find something about her if you, if you could find a newspaper from back then, but that's about it. Wait, you just said she was on this boat. Yeah, I did. Alice has got to be somewhere on this ship. Why the hell would you say something like that? Because I know. And just what is it you know? What happened to Alice after she was stolen? Junpei gulped. Alright, tell me. What happened to Alice? Seven nodded slowly and took on the look of a man recalling something long buried. Well, around the time, the word was that there was a thriving black market in New York. Okay, uh... Just breaking character for one moment, uh, Seven's voice is extremely straining 
and you've probably noticed over the past like couple minutes that I'm losing my voice. Uh, so for Seven instead, I'll just give him the closest thing I could think of. I'll give him like a cowboy accent or something like that. And we'll just pretend this is completely normal. I mean, I'm sure there there still is, but this was special. All millionaires from all over the world heard that Alice went up for auction there. The person who won the auction was Lord Dashiell Gordain. You heard that name before, right? Sir Gordain. Isn't he the guy who bought the Gigantic? The Titanic sister ship? Yeah, that's him. Though I guess he hadn't done that yet. What do you mean? Gordain bought Alice in 1912. And four years later in 1916, he bought the Gigantic. He had Alice somewhere on the Gigantic. But nobody knows where. He died in 1931. And apparently, he died without ever telling anyone where Alice was hidden. However... However, what? Well, he did have one close friend who asked him, Where's Alice? And he said, Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the forest of knowledge, beneath the navel of the gigantic. What the hell is that? Some kind of riddle? Your guess is as, your guess is as good as mine. Seven throws hands up in defeat. So that's it. Whatever you think, I believe it. She's hidden somewhere on the gigantic. Other words, she's hidden somewhere on the ship. Hmm. Before Jim Baker disputes Seven's rather bizarre claim, they heard Clover's voice from the door. She did not sound pleased. Hey, what are you two doing over there? Stop wasting time and get over here. Okay, okay, we're coming. Ugh. Seven looked at Junpei. Yeah, so anyway, that's the story. Might be useful someday. Don't forget it. That cryptic remark, he turned and left the room. Junpei was left behind to ponder what he'd just heard. He tried to remember what Jun had told him earlier. That mummy wasn't just a normal mummy. They say that she was frozen. The story says that from the time of its discovery all the way to through to when it got put on the Titanic, and even though it was carried through the desert, her body never melted. Was that Egyptian priestess Alice? Had the water in her body become Ice Nine? No, that's nuts. There's no way somebody like that could exist. Junpei shook his head, trying desperately to clear it, and followed Seven to the operating room where Clover was waiting. So, a lot of the things that we've seen so far in this route are linking up. So the first thing that we saw was the bookmark, which we don't know much about that yet. Uh, we'll get to that later. The second thing we learned is about Ice Nine and an Egyptian priestess, which is very similar to Seven's story about Ice Nine, and we learn more about the Egyptian priestess there, and her name is Alice, or All Ice. And you may not remember, but long ago, very early in this Let's Play, we heard All Ice somewhere before. Uh, we'll get back to there eventually anyways, so don't worry about that. Okay, got the key, and we're gonna make our way out here to leave. When suddenly, Clover goes to stand by the dummy here. Clover talks about how she's going to be next, since she still thinks that Snake is dead. She thinks that she's going to be next. And now, Junpei gave her the four-leaf Clover. This is the purpose of the bookmark that we got earlier. Oh yeah. He didn't know why, but suddenly Junpei remembered something he'd been given earlier. He reached into his pocket and dug it out. A four-leaf clover. Santa had given it to him in the second class room. He held it out to Clover. Did you know that each leaf on the four-leaf clover means something? Hope, faith, love, and luck. Take it. Use it as a good luck charm. He pressed the four-leaf clover into her hand. Listen to me, Clover. No matter what happens, you can never lose hope. You have to remember what's most important, and that's to have faith and to have love. If you can remember all of those, that'll give you good luck. Snake, I, I mean your brother, he's not dead. He's alive, somewhere. I'm sure of it. You've just got to believe in that. Clover stared at the four-leaf clover in her hand. 
You could see tears start to form at the corners of her eyes. Thank you. Her voice was tiny and broken, and as she spoke, she started to cry. She tried to hide her tears by looking at the floor, but it did little good. She wiped away tears with the baggy arms of her jacket, but more quickly took their place. No matter how she tried, she couldn't, she couldn't stop crying. Her tears made small wet circles on the floor. Thank you. She said it again. And then she looked up at Junpei and seemed to choke down the last of her grief. She did her best to smile. Junpei wiped an errant tear from her cheek with his thumb and gave her the best smile he could manage. Now come on. Seven's waiting for us at the exit. But still, she didn't move. Wait. Before we go, there's one thing I want to ask you. What's that? What do you think when you hear the word experiment? For a moment, his mind froze. Then he came back to his senses and realized that the word meant nothing to him, aside from the dictionary definition. Uh, what? Oh, huh. I guess it was just a coincidence then. I mean that you knew about the four-leaf clover. Uh, look, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a jerk, but you're making less than no sense right now. Oh, no, 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 it's nothing. Just forget about it. Ah, uh, don't give me that. You really think I could just drop this? What is this experiment you were talking about? Clover looked away. The four-leaf clover was still in her hand. She stared at it for a long moment, and then finally she spoke. You promise you won't tell anyone? Cross my heart. Really? Really. I can trust you, right? Of course you can. Clover slipped the four-leaf clover into her pocket. Her eyes still red from crying, she looked up at Junpei. Okay, then. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happened on this ship nine years ago. Wait, 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 wait. On this ship? Yeah, this ship. He was entirely lost. He had a thousand questions, but it was probably best, he thought, to save them until Clover had finished. It was an experiment to test some sort of psychic thing. Something about... Communicating through these fields you can't see? Fields that you can't see? He'd heard something like this before. Clover nodded. Like, think about this. She pointed at the operating table. On top of it was a somewhat mismatched medical mannequin whose parts had been swapped with another mannequin. This is John, right? But is he really John? All Junpei could think of was, she's finally completely lost it. Isn't this like Lock Socks? Or the ship of Theseus? Jinpei grew even more confused. He never heard of either of those things, although they sounded smart. You don't know? You haven't heard of those paradoxes? Jinpei shook his head. Clover laughed. Okay, well pay attention then. This is how Lock Socks works. Let's say I've got a pair of socks. They're my favorite socks. One of them gets a hole in it. What would you do if that was your sock, Junpei? Patch it up. Well, I guess I'd patch it up. Get some cloth and close up the hole. But what if another hole opens? I'd add, a, I'd add another patch, I suppose. What if another hole opened after that? Uh, another patch, I guess? Well, let's say you just keep adding new patches, until eventually the original cloth of the sock is totally gone. Once you get to that point, can you really say they're the same socks you started with? <laughs> hmm. That's, uh... That's tough. Junpei crossed his arms. So that's the locked socks thing? Yeah. The ship of Theseus is a lot like it. The ship of Theseus. If you keep fixing the damaged parts of a ship, eventually it ends up with none of the parts it started with. Can you really say that the ship of is the ship of Theseus that you started with? What if you took all the old parts from the first ship and build another one somewhere else? Then which ship is the real ship of Theseus? The one you repaired, or the one you built with all the original parts? Hmm... It was an interesting question. Clover could see Junpei was intrigued. Hey! Do you think it's the same? What's the same? These guys! Is this John, or is it Lucy now? Junpei looked at the operating table again. A mannequin full of body parts from a different body. Clover had been right. It was just like Locke's socks in the ship of Theseus. 
The part of the body that holds a person's identity is the head. Of course, for many hundreds of years, conventional wisdom, wisdom has held that a man's identity resided in his heart, or any number of internal organs. John's head and heart were both his, but apart from that, in a single arm, the rest of his body had once been Lucy's. Was that mannequin really John? We're just like these mannequins. She looked at Junpei again. Think about it. The cells in our body change every day. Old ones die and new ones are born. Maybe part of my arm is made of stuff from a fish I ate once. Or maybe part of your right side is made from a cow you ate. If you take it a little further, those cows and fishes are made from something else too, right? That's how we're all connected. Through fields that can't be seen with a naked eye. The silence was broken by seven. Hey! What the hell is taking you two so long? Seven's head appeared in the doorway. He was not happy. How long are you going to make me wait? We don't have time to screw around. Junpei and Clover looked at each other. Clover looked at Junpei as if to say there was more she wanted to tell him. She shook her head. Whatever she had to tell him, she didn't want to tell him in front of Seven. Seven seemed to catch on. Oh? What were you two doing? Was this some sort of secret meeting? No, it wasn't. We were just... Just... Playing with the mannequins. Huh? Let's go, Junpei. Moving a little bit too fast to be entirely innocent, Clover headed toward the exit. Seven stared after her, then turned to Junpei with an amused expression. Playing with the mannequins, huh? Didn't know you were into that kind of thing, Junpei. You're a dick. Junpei dashed past him and traced Clover's path out the door. With a short laugh, Seven followed. They stood, looking at the door. Junpei took out the Jupiter key. And we continue skipping past once more. Still no happiness here because Clover still did say that her brother might be dead. But we know from a different playthrough that he is in fact still alive. And Clover just needs to hold on to hope and hopefully it'll work out in the end. Anyways, that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and in the next episode, we're going to go ahead and get to the final number doors and see what decision we make there. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!